I have been captivated by the profound significance embedded in, Wu Gong instructs the army, dot this story goes beyond military training, it delves into how leaders can inspire the potential of their teams and shape the discipline of soldiers. By delving deeper into the strategic mysteries behind, Wu Gong instructs the army, we can extract wisdom and become better leaders. In the following content, I will share some personal insights and perspectives, aiming to stimulate your thoughts and inspire practical applications in your work and life. First, let's ponder a question, how did the relatively unknown Sun Tzu manage to meet the King of Wu? And why did the King of Wu decide to send palace maidens to test Sun Tzu's abilities? Sun Tzu, with his decisive and resolute style, showcased his strategic acumen and prowess in the palace of the King of Wu, leaving a profound impression on him. However, it's important to note that Sun Tzu was only 19 years old at the time and had left his hometown to come to the unfamiliar state of Wu. For a young man of humble origins like him to gain entry into the royal palace and meet the King of Wu was an incredibly challenging feat. Looking back at the story of, Wu Gong instructs the army, we come across some intriguing questions. Firstly, how did the King of Wu come to know about Sun Tzu's knowledge of military strategy? At that time, there were no media outlets, and the King of Wu hadn't personally visited the state of Qi or any other countries to gather information secretly. Before, Wu Gong instructs the army the King of Wu had no knowledge of Sun Tzu as a skilled and experienced general because there were no historical records. Sun Tzu seemed to emerge out of nowhere. So, I speculate that Sun Tzu had probably been staying in the state of Wu for some time by that point, and he did something remarkable. He established a martial arts school to promote his military ideas. During that era, Sun Tzu's concept of warfare was completely different from the mainstream Zhou dynasty ideology of benevolence and rituals. For instance, it was considered inappropriate to attack when the enemy was in a vulnerable state due to natural disasters or the death of their king. Warfare was expected to be conducted with propriety and restraint. It adhered to the rules of the game set before Sun Tzu's time. According to the prevailing mindset, war was regarded as a gentlemanly affair. However, Sun Tzu disagreed with this view and directly articulated his perspective, military tactics are deceptive. Warfare is based on deception, attacking the unprepared and unexpected. His viewpoint contradicted the Zhou dynasties, rituals, and benevolence entirely. This piqued people's interest, and word of mouth spread. More and more people started to study Sun Tzu's teachings, to such an extent that it reached the palace. The King of Wu finally became aware of the existence of such an individual within his realm. As a result, the King of Wu summoned Sun Tzu to the royal palace. Next, there is another question, why did the King of Wu choose to test Sun Tzu's abilities using palace maidens? There is a background to this, rooted in the profound influence of traditional, benevolence, and ritual ideology on the King of Wu. However, Sun Tzu's military philosophy was incredibly innovative, which intrigued the King of Wu but also made him hesitant to believe. Normally, women were not allowed on the battlefield. Yet, the King of Wu tasked Sun Tzu with training the palace maidens to become soldiers. He wanted to see just how groundbreaking Sun Tzu's military ideas were and to witness his capabilities firsthand. This task was considered impossible in the military circles of that time. Furthermore, Sun Tzu's military philosophy was in direct contradiction with the prevailing benevolence and righteousness ideology of that time. One of the principles behind establishing armies in the Zhou dynasty was rooted in benevolence and righteousness, while, the art of war, as depicted in, Wu Gong instructs the army, showcased Sun Tzu's stringent demands. Where did the principles of warfare come from? Originally, they evolved from military discipline, with the earliest form of military principles being military discipline itself. 
military discipline came first, and then the principles of warfare followed. However, Sun Tzu's teachings in The Art of War emphasized strict enforcement, absolute obedience, and the surrender of personal will. Sun Tzu explicitly stated that those who disobeyed orders should be executed. This stood in stark contrast to the prevailing ideology of the Zhou dynasty. There is another crucial point to consider. King of Wu was a monarch who embraced new ideas, dared to employ new individuals, and eagerly sought talent. What does a country need to become powerful? Undoubtedly, it requires talented individuals. Sun Tzu killed two of the king's beloved concubines, but in return, the king gained a skilled and strategic general who was also a theorist. Some individuals can lead troops but are illiterate, whereas Sun Tzu possessed unparalleled versatility, which was truly invaluable. Despite Sun Tzu's actions of killing the king's concubines and mocking him, the king did not exercise his royal authority to execute Sun Tzu. On the contrary, he promoted and utilized him. Just think about it, if the king had been a foolish ruler and immediately put Sun Tzu to death, would we still know about Sun Tzu today? History would have been rewritten. It was precisely because Sun Tzu had talent and the king had a need for him that Sun Tzu had the opportunity to showcase his abilities. In this way, the art of war transcended the confines of the study and became a formidable weapon for conquering adversaries on the battlefield. Therefore, the tremendous strength of the Wu Kingdom at that time was solely due to the king's wisdom and astute decision-making. Now, let me tell you about Sun Tzu's subsequent story. After the remarkable success of the Wu Gong instructs the army, Sun Tzu's reputation skyrocketed. The King of Wu recognized his talent and held him in high regard. Over the next 20 years, Sun Tzu achieved numerous military exploits. He led Wu's forces in campaigns under two generations of Wu kings, conquering the resilient state of Yu and establishing his dominance in the southeastern region. His name resounded far and wide, and he seemed invincible. However, during this period, King Gojian of Yu, who had been sleeping on firewood and tasting gall, quietly accumulated strength, preparing for a comeback. Meanwhile, the second generation of the Wu king became complacent, relaxed his vigilance, antagonized neighboring states, and, most outrageously, even executed Wu's renowned general, Wu Zixiu. This left Sun Tzu with no choice but to quietly retire and disappear without a trace. Then, in 473 BC, Yu defeated Wu, and the king of Wu was compelled to commit suicide, resulting in the downfall of the Wu kingdom. This marked the end of Sun Tzu's legendary story. Although Sun Tzu retreated into seclusion, what he left behind for the world was the invaluable treasure, the art of war, which has been passed down through the ages. The art of war is truly a stunning miracle. This book was a sensation that swept across the world at that time. So, what makes it so remarkable? I believe it is mainly because its military philosophy was completely different from the mainstream thinking of that time. As I mentioned earlier, warfare back then had its intricacies and required a noble demeanor. Not only were unorthodox methods frowned upon, even being too serious or relentlessly pursuing victory was considered inappropriate. War was meant to be conducted openly and honorably, like a gentleman. However, Sun Tzu didn't conform to these ideas. He bluntly stated, all warfare is based on deception. Hence, when able to attack, we must seem unable, when using our forces, we must appear inactive. This completely overturned the prevailing mindset of the time. He believed that war should be fought with stratagems and cunning, launching surprise attacks when the enemy is unprepared. Let me give you an example to demonstrate traditional warfare tactics. This story is taken from the Zhuo Zhuan and occurred in the year 638 BC. It recounts a historical event when the states of Song and Chu were at war. At that time, Chu intended to attack Song, 
and considering the numerical disadvantage of Song's troops, it seemed like a hopeless battle for them. On the day of the war, while the Chu army was halfway across the river, a general from the Song army rushed to advise the Song king, saying, Hey, your majesty, we must quickly defeat the enemy. However, the Song king refused to agree. He did not want to take advantage of the enemy's vulnerability. Instead, he foolishly waited until all the enemy troops had crossed the river. The general once again urged the Song king to attack the enemy quickly, emphasizing that they might lose the opportunity if they delayed any further. But the Song king persisted in his refusal and insisted on waiting for the enemy to form up properly. It was only when both sides had assumed their positions that the drums of war began to sound. As a result, Chu quickly overwhelmed Song, and the Song king was injured. Subsequently, the general started blaming the Song king, accusing him of lacking an understanding of the timing of warfare. However, if we listen to the Song king's response, he claimed to be a benevolent ruler. During warfare, he would not attack those who were already injured or the elderly soldiers with graying hair. He stated that in the past, people didn't rely on treacherous terrain for warfare. Even if Song were to be destroyed, he couldn't bear to strike at the enemy troops who hadn't yet assumed their battle formation. The above is the complete content of the story. Did you feel it? It's truly an astonishing story. Not to mention etiquette, even the timing of warfare must be considered. Through the story, we can see that this is the essence of the art of war. Its viewpoints are a complete reversal of ancient perspectives on warfare. In my opinion, the so-called morality and righteousness of King of Song is nothing but pure foolishness. They were excessively obsessed with upholding noble customs to the point of absurdity. However, Sun Tzu didn't care about such trivial matters. He took a different approach to warfare, breaking free from moral norms. In war, one must find ways to make the enemy uncomfortable, using unconventional tactics and opposing their expectations. In modern terms, Sun Tzu's military philosophy is completely unconcerned with morality. War is a killing machine, and on this stage of war, Sun Tzu tells us that it's either life or death. Stop using morality as an excuse. Any means can be used, and the most effective tactics should be employed. The art of war opened up new horizons in the field of Chinese military strategy, injecting fresh ideas into the realm of warfare. Before this, all those military texts just kept on blabbering about morality and righteousness. This is my understanding of why the art of war is considered an extraordinary book. It has pioneered a completely new field and continues to be widely known and studied to this day. The video is almost coming to an end, and I want to thank you all for watching. I hope that during this time, you have gained a deeper understanding of the background and the intellectual value of The Art of War. If you are interested in The Art of War, remember to click the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so you don't miss our upcoming exciting content. In the next video, I will share unique insights on strategic thinking from the Calculations chapter of The Art of War. Thank you all for your support and attention. See you in the next episode.